Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Chag Sameach. Welcome to our Rosh Hashanah service. Rosh Hashanah is all about the coming of the King, uh, coming of the Lord as King, King over Israel, a King over all the earth, and King over our hearts uh, and our lives. And that's why this day is known in Jewish tradition as HaMelech, uh, the King. It's also one of the reasons why we blow the shofar, as we, that we just heard, is to herald the coming of the King. In the Hebrew Scriptures, when the King comes, King of Messiah, uh, He ushers in a new covenant. Most people think of, of the new covenant as some kind of Christian concept, but it's actually 100% Jewish. Spoken of by the Jewish prophet Yirmiyahu, Jeremiah, 600 years before the birth of Yeshua. Uh, here's what the book of Jeremiah says. This is Jeremiah 31, 31, about the new covenant. Yeah, the Lord says to Jeremiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a brit hadashah, a new covenant, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors. I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my Torah, my law on their hearts. And I will, and I will put it in their minds and I'll write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they have to teach their neighbors or say to one another, know the Lord. Because they'll all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness, and I'll remember their sins no more. This famous passage tells us a lot about who God is. He is a covenant-keeping God. The God of Israel who wants to enter into a covenant, a new covenant, with you and with me. And it's crucial for us to know who God is on this Rosh Hashanah day when we pray for our names to be inscribed in the Book of Life. Indeed, you know, every intellectual mistake and every destructive emotion, every crushing guilt, uh, bitterness, hate, a paralyzing fear, a hopeless despair, every intellectual mistake, every destructive emotion, every harmful behavior stems, at least in part, from not knowing or, or refusing to know or forgetting at the moment who God is. So, for example, I know in my heart that God is merciful, that He's sovereign, that He's holy, that He is wise. And yet, at every point at which I do something wrong, as I reflect upon it later on, it's because at that moment, I'm forgetting who God is. Or even worse, refusing to acknowledge who He is. So, what's, what's, uh, what's wrong with me uh, at its root, at least in part, is theological. Uh, I'm forgetting who God is. And I suggest that's true of you too. Because the Bible says that, of all, that all of our problems come from this, from not knowing the Lord, uh, and not knowing who He is, or forgetting at the moment, or not living it, or, or refusing to acknowledge who He is, uh, and to submit our lives to Him as our King, and to conform our thoughts and our emotions and our words and our actions to His ways. So who is God? Uh, what is He like? This passage tells us He is a covenant God. He is a God who makes covenants, uh, and a God you can only relate to through covenants. Uh, uh, and this passage tells us about God's promise to bring a new covenant to the people of Israel that will supplement the Mosaic covenant. So let's focus on three key things that are revealed here by Jeremiah. We're going to put this on the overhead. These three things. Number one, what a covenant is, what the new covenant, uh, uh, what is the new covenant, what it solves, and how it changes and transforms us. So number, no, number one, what, what the covenant is, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I make a, a Brit Hadashai, new covenant with Beit Yisrael and Beit Yehuda, the house of Israel and Judah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their ancestors, their forefathers. All through the Bible, whenever God relates to anyone, he relates in terms of a covenant. What is that? What is a covenant? Uh, we need to examine this because in our, in our culture, uh, this very concept of a, of a covenant relationship is disappearing. A covenant in the Bible is a bond that creates a particular kind of profound uh, and sacred and close-knit, permanent, personal relationship. It's a relationship that on the one hand 
is much more intense and more personal than a relationship based only on a legal contract. But on the other hand, it's a relationship that's more durable and binding and unconditional than a relationship based only on personal affection or feeling. It's a stunning blend of law and love. It's a personal relationship made more intimate and more personal because it's legally binding. It's this amazing combination of law and love because in a covenant relationship, uh, you can trust the other person because each side has made a vow. Each side has, has lost their independence to some degree. Each side has made a promise and as a promise to be faithful and to be thoughtful and to be kind and to be loving in spite of any circumstances and in spite of your feelings. It is a brilliant and fascinating and stunning blend of law and love. It's a love relationship made more loving and more intimate because it's legally binding. Now, at the human level, or between human beings, the classic covenant relationship, of course, is marriage. Uh, and even here, though, notice because God, has, God says this as well. He has a covenant relationship with Israel, and he calls himself a husband. Look at verse 32. You're a husband. I was a husband to you, he says. In the Bible, God always relates to his people through covenants. If you go back to the very beginning with Adam and Eve, God didn't just say, hi, I want you to do this, uh, but, but he says, but rather he says, I want you to do this and I will do this. That's covenantal language. The Lord makes a covenant then with Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, promising to bless Abraham and his descendants, the Jewish people. When the Lord takes our people Israel out of bondage in Egypt, he takes us to Mount Sinai. Uh, and what does he do? He makes a covenant, the Mosaic covenant, which is referenced here in this passage in Jeremiah. Well, when Yeshua the Messiah comes, he announces at his last Pesach Seder, his last supper, a new covenant. And he, he paraphrases Jeremiah 31. At every point, whenever God relates to us, he's relating covenantally. And as we said, a covenant is always this stunning blend, uh, this mixture of law and love, both command and promise. And that means that the God of the Bible isn't a cardboard, one-dimensional God as many of us today imagine him. Some people characterize God primarily in terms of moral absolutes. Uh, he's the lawgiver. Uh, he's the one who lays down the law and then punishes you and smites you if you don't obey. The other popular, actually more popular idea today is the other extreme. I believe in a God of love. I believe in a God who's completely loving and accepts everyone no matter how they live. He just loves everyone and accepts everyone just the way you are. Both these descriptions are cardboard caricatures of a one-dimensional God. But a covenant God, by definition, is a God as much of law and holiness and justice as he is of love. And as much of love and grace and mercy as he is of law. He's complex. He's not tame. You can't put him in a box. The covenant God, the God of the Bible, the real God, is not at all like the God of the popular modern imagination. So this is what a covenant is. And once you think of God as a covenant God, and you reread the Bible through this lens, it helps you understand sin and judgment and human nature and redemption and then why we're here on this earth and how we're to relate to the Lord. Now, secondly, in the text, this new covenant that's presented here is solving a problem. The problem is this. It's alluded to in verse 31, 32, which God wonderfully evokes the whole history of the Mosaic Covenant, which forged us as a people. So he says this in Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Yehudah. It won't be like the covenant I made with their forefathers. I took them by hand, lead them out of the land of Mitzrayim, of Egypt, which they, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband unto them, says the Lord. Right here we have an allusion to what this puzzle is. There's a puzzle, there's a riddle in the Bible. Because on the one hand, there's dozens of places in the Tanakh and the Hebrew Scriptures where God says to his people Israel, you must obey me. You must keep my covenant and you'll be blessed if you do and you'll be protected and you'll, you'll be prosperous. I'll prosper you. But if you don't, you'll be cursed uh, and I will reject you and you'll be cut off. So, for example, look at the Shemot 19, Exodus 19, right at the Mount Sinai, verse 5. The Lord says to Israel, now if you obey me fully and if you keep my covenant... Then out of all the nations, out of all the goyim, you'll be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you'll be for me a melechet kohanim, a kingdom of priests, and a goy kadosh, a holy nation. Notice the Lord says here this if-then language. 
if you keep my covenant, if you obey me fully, then you'll be my treasured possession. You'll be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. If then, that's conditional language. It looks, so it looks like here, very clearly, the covenant is conditional. It's conditioned on our obedience. God says, yes, I'll bless you, I'll protect you, I'll prosper you, but you have to obey or else I'll reject you. So here it looks like the condition is, co is the covenant is conditional. But on the other hand, there are dozens and dozens of places in the Hebrew Scriptures all throughout the Old Covenant where God says to Israel, I'll never reject you. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I will never forsake my covenant. So, for example, in Judges 2, verse 1, the Lord says, I brought you up out of Egypt. I led you to the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. But in Exodus 19, God says to Israel, if you break my covenant, you'll be rejected. But here and in many other places, God says, I will never, ever, ever forsake you. Uh, I, you're graven on my hand. You are mine. So, for example, look at Yeshiahu, Isaiah 49, 14. But Zion said, the Lord's forsaken me. The Lord's forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she's born? Though she may forget, I will never forget you. See, I've engraven you on my palms. On the hands, your walls, Jerusalem, are ever before me. So which is it? Is the covenant, which means is your relationship with God, basically conditional? Or is it basically unconditional? Is it basically grounded in human obedience? God will bless you, but you've got to obey. Or is it basically grounded in God's love? Yes, you need to obey, but in the end, God will accept you anyway. Which is it? It's a big question. Because throughout the Bible, you've got statements that seem to contradict one another. Uh, you'll be rejected if you don't obey. You'll never be rejected. So some people come down to the side of the covenant being basically conditional. They look at the promise, I'll never forsake you. They look at the command, you must obey the law. Uh, and what they say is the promise is relative, but the command is absolute. Uh, yes, God says, I'll never forsake you. Yes, but you've got to obey in the end. The promise is relative, but the command is absolute. And this is legalism. This is works righteousness. I'm trying to earn my way to God's favor by my good works. Because unless you obey, God's not going to bless you. Other people come down on the other side, uh, 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 the other side of legalism, on the side of, of relativism. They, they, don't, uh, they don't say that basically the relationship is conditional with God. They come down on the other side. They say basically that our relationship with God is unconditional. They look at the promise, I will never forsake you. They look at the command, you must obey. They say the promise is absolute. The command is conditional, it's relative. They say, yeah, 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 you've got to obey, but in the end, it really doesn't matter. God's going to accept you anyway. So you, uh, so you come down either on the side of legalism and works righteousness, or on the side of relativism and, and license and lawlessness and cheap grace. So which is it? Is, is God's covenant conditional? Or is it unconditional? Is it just, uh, and this is not just a philosophical or a theological issue. It's a very personal issue. When people, for example, when people come to me for counseling and for help them with their personal problems and their struggles and their issues, it all generally falls into one of these two categories. So practically everything I do, everything I need to do is either one or the other. So I've got as a counselor, as a pastor, I've, I basically got two jobs. Uh, as a messianic rabbi, uh, as a pastoral counselor, depending on which category the person is in. I either need to comfort the disturbed or to disturb the comfortable. <laughs> because everyone in that, everyone, and it comes in in one of these two categories, basically. So my job is, number one, to help people see who, who don't think they're under the dominion of sin, that they really are under the dominion of sin. And for people who mistakenly think that they're, they're hopelessly under the dominion of sin, I need to show them they're really not. Let me put it this way. Some people have their consciences screwed on too loose. They think everything's fine. I'm fine. They've got great self-esteem. They think they've been told the whole life over and over again, you're wonderful just the way you are. No one should impose their values on you. It's up to you to decide what's right and what's wrong for you. And these are self-indulgent people. These are people who always put themselves first. Uh, these are people who are always cutting corners. Uh, they're not loyal. They don't keep their promises. They don't keep their commitments. Uh, they jump from one thing to another, 
from one relationship to another, from one congregation to another, as long as it makes them happy at the time. They're selfish. They're self-centered. They need to feel more guilty about things, uh, and they don't. And as a result, they're doing all kinds of destructive things, and their consciences are screwed on too loose. The other category of people is who's con- those whose consciences are screwed on too tight. And they don't like themselves, and they're down on themselves. And they feel like, I try so hard, but I can never live up to anything. I can't live up to my standards. I can't live up to my parents' standards or my culture's standards. And they're always uh, feeling down and beating themselves up. You know why? Because at bottom, everyone tends to fall on, on one side or the other. Is your relationship with God conditional or unconditional? Is it basically a matter of legalism or basically a matter of relativism? Uh, legalism leads people to have consciences who, who are screwed on too tight, and they're always beating themselves up. Relativism tends to leads people who, to have people whose consciences are screwed on too loose. They're always thinking what really matters, what's really important, is what I want to do. What's the way forward? The way forward is the new covenant. In Jeremiah 31, God said, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. It'll be different from the covenant they broke, the Mosaic covenant. So if we're going to understand the new covenant, we first have to understand the Mosaic covenant. God brings the children of Israel, God brings our people Israel to Mount Sinai. He gives them basically two things. He gives them the Ten Commandments, and he gives them the tabernacle. What is that? That is law and love. Because on the one hand, he gives us the tablets. He writes the Ten Commandments on two tablets of stone. And Moses brings these down from the mountain, and he says, this is how you've got to live. This is the law. But on the other hand, he also gives us the tabernacle. What takes place inside the tabernacle? The sacrifices for atonement of sin, to restore our broken fellowship with God. Because God says, I know you're not going to keep my law. And therefore, when you break my law, you need to have your sins atoned for and forgiven. And here's how you can get them forgiven. By faith in my provision through blood sacrifice, through an innocent blood being shed, uh, and your sins being covered by the blood sacrifice, which is put to death on your behalf uh, as a picture of what you deserve for breaking the law. Every time you sin, God says, you bring a sacrifice to have your sins atoned for. Uh, and then you have law and you have love. You always have both law and love in a covenant. But Israel, our people, we broke the covenant. And we not only failed to obey the law, we didn't even observe the sacrifices. We not only broke the law, we didn't even ask for forgiveness. We broke the covenant. The Mosaic covenant, in this sense, it was a failure. But God comes back in his love and in his mercy, and he promises a new covenant to take the place of the one that we broke. We broke the covenant given on Mount Sinai. But God comes back with a second chance, a new beginning, a promise of his Messiah, which will write his Torah, write his law, write his commandments on our heart. So we have this problem. Is the Mosaic Covenant conditional or unconditional? And God comes back and he shows, us, he shows us a different way, a better way, a new covenant. And this is how he describes it. Look at verse 33, Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after that time, says God. I'll put my Torah on their minds and I'll write my law on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. God says, I'll write my law on your hearts. There's the law. The new covenant still has law. Yes, of course, all covenants must have law. But look what God says. No longer will this law just be external and outward uh, and involuntary and written on outward tablets of stone uh, and a forced legal code. But God says this in, in verse 33, Jeremiah 31, 33, I'll put my law in your minds and I'll write it on your hearts. Now it becomes internalized. It comes within you now. Now, through the new covenant, we want to obey, and we're empowered to obey because it becomes part of us. It's written on our hearts and our minds from the inside out, and and, and it governs our thoughts and the intentions of our hearts, not just our outward actions. Through the new covenant, we're given new hearts and new minds, and we become a new people. The new covenant scripture, uh, this is really, the new covenant scripture describes what it really means to be born again. Uh, this is actually a very Jewish concept to be born again. The Hebrew prophet Ezekiel, Yehezkel, describes it like this in uh, Ezekiel 36, 26. He says, I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit within you. 
I'll remove your heart of stone, uh, your hard-heartedness, and I'll give you a heart of flesh, tender-heartedness. Uh, uh, and I'll put my spirit within you, and I'll move you then with my spirit in, in, in you to, to obey my law, right? to follow my decrees, and be careful to keep my law. These are amazing promises from Ezekiel, from God through Ezekiel. On the one hand, he's actually heightening the law's demands. Because instead of the law being only written on tablets of stone, God says, I'm going to put it in your heart, and it's going to require now that your internal motives and your intentions be pure and be holy. But on the other hand, there's also a reconciliation going on as well. God's saying, I'm going to give you now a new inner desire, a new inner ability to keep my law. I'm going to change your rebellious heart so you will want to keep my law. Oh, you'll no longer be obeying it as just some kind of external, out of external fear of punishment or coercion or force. No. But the motivation to follow me, the Lord says, in my ways will now come from within you, from the inside. You will want to do it to please me. So number one, the new covenant still has law, but it's now inscribed in our heart. And number two, the new covenant has love. Oh my God, does it have love. Because the Lord says this in verse 34, Jeremiah 31, 34. I will forgive their wickedness. I will remember their sins no more. No more endless sacrifices. The Lord says in the new covenant, I will remember your sins no more. This is talking about a new whole level of forgiveness and freedom from guilt and condemnation that was never ever known in the Mosaic covenant. In other words, the new covenant also has law and love. But somehow now they're reconciled. Somehow in the new covenant, there's an experience of love that enables us to want to obey his law. It's some kind of reconciliation. But how? How? Instead of law and love now being two opposing forces that that we must choose from somehow, now in the new covenant, they come together. They're merged together. How? Here's how. The answer to this amazing question, how can God do this, is found in the New Covenant Scriptures. In 2 Corinthians 3, uh, the Apostle Paul, he calls himself the minister of the New Covenant. Uh, And this is Jeremiah's language. And then he says, the gospel, the the good news of Yeshua the Messiah, he says, when you believe in him, when you trust in him, he says this in verse 3, 2 Corinthians 3, 3, it writes the law not on tablets of stone, uh, but on tablets of your heart. And then he goes on to say this in 2 Corinthians um, 3, verse 7. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved on letters of stone, came with glory, so the Israelites could not even look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, uh, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts. Therefore, since we have a hope, we are very bold, we're not like Moses, put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds were made dull. Uh, For to this this very day a veil remains whenever the Mosaic covenant is read. It's not been removed. Why? Because only in Messiah is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, A veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, that veil is taken away. Paul saying, through trusting in Yeshua and committing your life to him, this new covenant relationship with God comes about. So that there's now a reconciliation of law and love in your heart. Instead of obeying only out of fear of punishment, you now want to obey the Lord because you've got just an experience of his love through Yeshua the Messiah that you want to obey him. Law and love come together in your heart through submitting your life to the good news of Yeshua the Messiah and trusting in Him. Well, how is that possible? Here's how it's possible. Between the law in verse 33 and and, and His love at the bottom of verse 34, we have this, Jeremiah 31, 33. The Lord says, I will be their God, and they will be my people. And throughout the Bible, whenever a covenant is mentioned, God sums it up like this. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Now, when you say to somebody, I'm yours, or I'll be yours, or I want to be yours, what does that mean? I'm yours means I'm giving myself to you. It means I'm putting your intentions first, your interests first. It means I'm losing my independence for your sake. I'm putting you first. 
Now, when in verse 33, the Lord says, you will be my people, how do we understand that? How do we give ourselves to God? You submit your lives to him. You surrender your will to his. You say, not may my will be done, but yours be done, Lord. You obey him. You follow his ways. Uh, you give up all other gods. You give up all other idols. Idol is anything in your life that you put before God. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But how that, that's how we give ourselves to God. But, but how can God give himself to us? How can God lose his independence? Here's the answer. At the last Pesach Seder, the night before he died on the tree, on the cross, Yeshua, he picked up a, the cup of, of the third cup of the Seder at the table. And he looks at his disciples, his Tom and he says this in Matthew 26, 28. He says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Wow, he's quoting Jeremiah 31. His disciples got to know this. They know the Bible. This reference to the new covenant is a reference to Jeremiah. So what's Yeshua saying? He's saying, remember Jeremiah. Remember the new covenant. Remember that Jeremiah said sometime in the future, there'd be a Brit Hadashai, new covenant relationship with God made available. It's going to be more loving and more binding and more transforming than the old covenant, than the Mosaic covenant. Remember that promise Yeshua was saying to his disciples, it is coming true before your eyes this night. It's the new covenant in my blood. It's coming true as I die on the cross. And as I rise again the third day, my death and resurrection, they bring about the new covenant. My death and resurrection bring about the reconciliation of law and love. My death and resurrection bring about a more binding and yet also more loving and, and more transforming covenantal relationship between you and God. How? Well, Paul in Galatians 3 says, when Yeshua went to the cross, he was cursed for us. He took the curse of the law so that we could receive the blessing of his spirit. That's covenantal language. The Torah says if you obey the covenant, you'll be blessed. If you disobey the covenant, you'll be cursed. Yeshua obeyed the covenant perfectly, and he earned the blessing. But in the end, the end of his life on the cross, he took the curse of the covenant that we deserve. Yeshua left heaven, he becomes a human being, he lives his perfect sinless life, he does, he does the one thing no one has ever been able to do, he does. And then, and then when he appears to Yochanan, John, the, the immerser, uh, John tries to deter him from being, from being immersed, from being baptized. And, and, and he says this in Matthew 3, 14. John says to Yeshua, I should be baptized, I should be immersed by you, and you come to me? And what does Yeshua say? He says, let it be so now, for it's proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. What's he saying? Yeshua is saying, I've come as a human being to completely fulfill the covenant, to do everything that I'm required to do, that, is a, that a human being is required to do, to love God with all my heart and my soul and my strength and my might, to love my neighbor as myself. And he did. He completely obeys the covenant as a human being, thus earning the blessing of the covenant. But at the end of the life, when he goes to the cross, he takes the curse of the covenant upon himself, the curse that we deserve for being a covenant breaker so that when we trust in him, his blessing then becomes ours. We remember our sins today on this Rosh Hashanah day. We ask God to forgive us. We ask God to inscribe our names in the book of life for another year. We acknowledge that we break God's covenant. We break God's law daily. And therefore, we deserve the curse of the covenant. We deserve death. But Yeshua the Messiah, he takes on our sins on, him, on himself on the cross as the, as the ultimate sacrifice that all the sacrifices of the tabernacle and the temple pointed to. This is the ultimate act of love. Yeshua the Messiah taking the curse of the covenant on our behalf, that if we surrender our life to him, he gives us the, the blessing of the covenant that he's earned, of eternal life with God. Um, and, and thus, we, we, uh, we read this in, in 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That one verse is the gospel. That's the good news of Messiah. That's the answer that, you know, to, that keeps us from becoming either legalists or relativists. As legalists, we want to emphasize our need to obey the Lord and obey his, his, his law if you want his blessing. As relativists, we want to emphasize God's love and his grace and his mercy that forgives us. Both are true. How do we reconcile them? 
The gospel is the answer. Yeshua the Messiah is the answer to all the riddles. So is the covenant conditional or unconditional? Is your relationship with God, is it conditional or is it unconditional? Class, what's the answer? (laughs) The answer is yes. (laughs) Is it conditional on human obedience? Yes. God became a human being in Yeshua, in the Messiah. It fulfilled all the conditions of the covenant so that when you repent, and you've got to repent, uh, and when you believe in him and make him the Lord of your life, not just saying he's your savior, but truly making him your king, uh, he can then be committed to you unconditionally forever. Now, what are we supposed to do with that? You look at the cross and you ask yourself this question. On the cross, when Yeshua was dying, was he fulfilling God's law or was he fulfilling God's love? What's the answer, class? Yes, the answer is yes, both. (laughs) The cross's death shows us how important the law is. The law is so important that Yeshua had to die. And on the cross, he's completely fulfilling the covenant. He's honoring justice and the fact that we must obey God. But on the cross, as he died, he's also fulfilling the love of God. Look at Romans 5, verse 8. It tells us God demonstrates his love for us. How? And that while we were yet sinners... Messiah died for us. On the tree, through his death, Yeshua is making it possible for God to be both just, meaning fulfilling the law, and justifier, meaning fulfilling his love for those who trust in him. And because on the cross, law and love are now completely reconciled. Once you surrender to Messiah, uh, then in your heart, then love and law become reconciled. And now you want to obey. Not out of coercion, not out of fear, but out of love out of gratitude and thanksgiving for all the Lord has done for you in redeeming you from death and inscribing your name in the book of life, not just for another year, but forever, in the Lamb's book of life, in Messiah's book of life. Now, what do we want to do with that this day? This is what the Lord says in Jeremiah 31, 33. I will be their God, and you will be my people. This is where he says, I'm yours. And we know what that means, that, that the Lord is a covenant God. He says, I will be your God. Uh, And it's on the cross that this is fulfilled. It's on the cross he gave himself to you fully. On the cross is where he became yours. It's on the cross where he lost his independence so that we could could, could, uh, uh, make ourselves his forever. So as we close right now, I want want us to look at these truths uh, and how it's going to change your life, the truth of this, these truths of the covenant in four ways. In four ways, these truths about God's covenant will change your life. Four ways. Number one, I want you to take the idea of God being a covenant God and use it now to recalibrate your conscience. To recalibrate your conscience. And it depends on your temperament. It depends on your parental background. Uh, because everyone tends to be either a legalist at heart or a relativist at heart. Everyone has a certain cast of mind. Uh, as a very broad generalization, Messianic Jews tend more towards legalism. Uh, Reformed Jews tend more towards relativism. Uh, for the legalist, it's, I've got to be good. I've got to live up to the standard. For the relativist, it's basically, it's okay. doesn't matter. Uh, We've we got to accept one another the way we are. Uh, and, and your choices in the end, you know, the moral law really doesn't matter all that much. In the end, what matters is love. Only the gospel will help you to recalibrate your conscience so it's not screwed down too tight and it's not screwed down too loose. And every one of us, everyone here in this room, including me, we need to make a correction in one direction or another. Ask yourself, what direction do I need to go in? If you're a believer today who understands the gospel, you see Yeshua dying on the cross. You know what that means? First of all, it means the law is important and sin is wrong. It is deadly wrong. You can't shrug at it. You can't wink at sin. You've got to resist it with all your might. But when you see Yeshua dying on the cross, you know that when you fail, nonetheless, he is committed to you. And you need not despair. So recalibrate your conscience. Number two, use the gospel of the covenant to not only recalibrate your conscience, but also to critique your culture. Every culture falls into one of these two categories of legalism or relativism. For example, I was talking to someone recently whose parents, uh, one, they had one parent who was American and one parent who was Asian. And we were discussing this, this book that's been very popular called Generation Me. 
uh, which is about how we raise children in America. Uh, it's all about self-esteem. Uh, and everybody's wonderful, and, and you're great, and nobody should ever try to change you. You've got to decide who you want to be. No one should try to impose their moral standards on you. You decide what you want to be, and you're just wonderful the way you are, and you just need to be you. And this person tells me, yeah, that's exactly what my American parent says. But no way my Asian parent ever says that. <laughs> my Asian parent says, you better be good. You better live up to our expectations and live up to our standards. Now, do you know what the gospel means? Do you know what the covenant means? It means that every culture is wrong in some ways. Every culture, to some extent, is wrong. And we need to be people who are transformed by the gospel and are blinded to our culture. We need people, for example, and most of us in this room, who can transcend our white race and our American culture and critique it from a biblical perspective and a biblical point of view. Because the gospel takes you a little bit out of your culture, just a bit. It doesn't stop you from being who you are, but it pulls you enough out so you can critique your own culture. So use the gospel to, number one, recalibrate your conscience. And number two, critique your culture. And number three, use the gospel to increase your loyalty quotient. In America, the idea of a covenant relationship, it's just about gone. Instead, we only have a primarily consumer relationship. A consumer relationship is one where my needs are more important than the relationship. So, for example, I have a consumer relationship with Starbucks. I have, a, I have a nice relationship with my corner Starbucks as long as they're giving me a good product for a good price. If the price goes too high, if the product goes too low, I'm out of there. <laughs> I find another relationship, another vendor, another coffee shop that meets my needs better. A consumer relationship is one where my need is more important uh, than the relationship. A covenant relationship is the opposite. It's, it's where the individual personal relationship is more important than my needs. I'm bound. I'm sticking there. I am committed there. Now, in the business world, it's okay to have consumer, consumer relationships. But in our personal world, there should be a lot more covenant relationships than there are. Your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your family, your relationship with your friends, your relationship with your spiritual congregation, with your Messianic synagogue. But, you know, increasingly in America, all relationships are becoming mere consumer relationships. For example, in your congregation, you jump from congregation to congregation at the drop of a hat. For example, I've had people at this congregation uh, leave this congregation because they didn't like what a guest speaker said one day. Um, your family, your family loyalty is nothing like what it used to be. Children, they're quick to go off, quick to leave behind their faith, leave behind the practices and the values and the worldview of their family, go off and do their own thing. Your spouse, divorce and abandonment is rampant in America, even among believers. The one sacred covenant till death do us part, it means nothing anymore. Instead, the attitude is, as soon as my needs aren't being met, I am out of there. So use the gospel to increase your loyalty quotient. Use the gospel, gospel to help make you more patient and more long-suffering and more humble and more other-oriented and more faithful and for your relationships to be made more durable. And finally, number four, use the gospel of the covenant to get over your mistrust of God. Modern secular philosophy, especially championed by people like Nietzsche and, and Sartre, uh, they assert that if there is a God, he dehumanizes you. You can't trust him. And he, that's the very theme of Sartre's famous book called No Exit. Uh, he claimed that he could not stand the concept of God, a God who knows all and who sees all and who's always watching you. He claims that it coerces us and it dehumanizes us. That if someone can see you but you can't see him, that this dehumanizes you. And Sartre's assumption was that you've got to submit to a God. You don't do that because he'll exploit you. Uh, uh, you must live without God. And only then are you truly human and truly free. Sartre was bound up by the spirit of rebellion and the spirit of fear and elevating his notion of, of the supreme independence and, and self-actualization as his idol above all goods, including God himself. And that's the very same, by the way, interestingly, the very same mindset as the serpent in the garden. The serpent tempted Eve 
telling her God really can't be trusted. He doesn't have your best interest in mind, in mind, in your heart. He's going to exploit you. He's holding back. He doesn't want you to enjoy all the great benefits of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, why? Uh, because he's jealous of you. Uh, he's a petty God. He doesn't want you to become like him and become his rival. You know, Eve, he's holding you back. He, he's not out for you. Eve, he's not having your best interest in mind. He's holding you down. He can't be trusted. He does not have your best interest at heart. So go ahead. Eat the apple. That was the lie of the serpent. God can't be trusted. This is the very heart of Sartre's philosophy. Sartre said, I don't want a God looking at me because he can't be trusted. He just wants to rob me of my freedom and my independence and impose his rules on me. And if you give yourself to God, he'll exploit you. But Messianic faith, Yeshua faith, is the only religion, the only faith system that says no. God can be trusted. Why? Because he has given himself fully to you. God took the plunge of love. God voluntarily lost his independence for your sake and became a human being. And he went to the cross in the person of Yeshua the Messiah. And he took your sin and suffered and died the death that you should have suffered and died for you. He lived the life you should have lived. He died the death you should have died. He gave his all for you and he, ha he held nothing back. So you can trust him. The Lord says, Jeremiah 31, 33, I will be their God and they will be my people. Which came first? He did. He said, I will be your God. He said that first. He gave himself. And then now you can give yourself. You can trust him. Let me close with this. A few of you, some of you have heard me tell this before, but I'm going to tell it again. Uh, in the book, The Life of Pi, uh, by Jan Martel, this main character is exploring all sorts of different religions. He's leaning towards Hinduism. And he starts talking to a Catholic priest. And the priest starts to tell this character about Yeshua, and about Yeshua's death on the cross. And, and this main character, this Indian boy, he freaks out. Uh, and this is what he says. We'll have it on the overhead. He says, that a God should put up with adversity? I can understand that. The gods of Hinduism face their fair share of thieves, bullies, kidnappers, usurpers. Indeed, what is the Ramayana but one long bad day for Rama? <laughs> Advers adversity, yes. Reversals of fortune, yes. Treachery, yes. But humiliation? Death? I couldn't imagine Lord Krishna consenting to be stripped naked, whipped, mocked, dragged through the streets as the top it off, crucified at the hands of mere humans to boot. I never heard of a Hindu god dying. But divinity shouldn't be blighted by death. It's wrong. It was wrong for this Christian god to let his avatar die. That's tantamount to letting a part of himself die. For the son of God is to die. He can't be faking it. Well, if Yeshua is God on the cross, he's just, just a shamming, uh, the shamming some human tragedy, then it turns the passion of Messiah into the farce of Messiah. So the death of the Son must be real. Father Martin assured me that it was. But once a dead God, always a dead God, even resurrected. The Son must always have the taste of death forever in his mouth. The, tri the triunity of God must be tainted by it. There must be a certain stench at the right hand of God the Father. Uh, the, the, the horror must be real. Why? Why would God wish that upon himself? Why not leave death to mortals? Why make dirty that which is beautiful? Why spoil that which is perfect? Love. Love was Father Martin's answer. Love. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have life everlasting. Receive his love on this Rosh Hashanah. Crown Yeshua, the king of your life. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and pray. I want the music team to come on up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you today in this Rosh Hashanah. We thank you, Lord, for the Brit Hadashah. We thank you, Lord, today for the new covenant. We thank you that in the new covenant of Yeshua, that in the gospel of Messiah's death and resurrection, law and love are reconciled. The answer to the excesses of legalism and relativism 
is the new covenant. We thank you, Lord, where you're, with the love of God, your love is written on our hearts. Your law is written on our hearts through your love, the love of God, the love of Yeshua, by Yeshua, by you dying for us, Yeshua, for our sins. And being raised again the third day for our salvation, that if we truly trust in you, Lord, we have this law and love reconciled. Why, Yeshua, why would you die for us? You tell us, Lord, in one word, love. So, Lord, right now we receive your love. We receive the new covenant in your blood shed on the cross for us. Lord, we have broken your law. We have broken your Ten Commandments. Lord, today on this Rosh Hashanah, we repent. We ask your forgiveness through Yeshua and through his new covenant. Lord, we surrender our life to you, Yeshua, to your lordship to your kingship, so that you will be our God and we will be your people. Lord, recalibrate our conscience today to honor and to obey your law, to put our law above all of our own ideas of good and evil, so that we stop repeating the sins of Adam and Eve. Help us, Lord, to see and to evaluate our own culture and our own worldview and our own values through the lens of your cross, through the lens of your word, through the lens of the new covenant. Lord, help to increase my loyalty today uh, to you. Help me to increase my loyalty to my spouse and to my family and to my parents. Lord, help me today to increase the loyalty to my congregation. Help me to, write, to walk in loyal covenantal relationships, not self-centered consumer relationships. Because you, Lord, are a covenant God. Write my name today, Lord, in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hallelujah. The Book of the New Covenant. The Book of Yeshua, the Messiah. We pray this all in your name, Yeshua. Amen. For more information, visit us at www.etzheim.org. That's spelled E-I-T-Z-C-H-A-I-M.org or join us in Richardson, Texas for our weekly Shabbat services.